Good morning. Welcome to Trading Hour. I am Reema Tanduka. With me is Hormuz Patakia and it looks like it's going to be a quiet close to this week. But this week has been so topsy-turvy, right? The first two days, Monday and Tuesday, there was a correction in the markets, continuing from the previous week. On Wednesday, you showed signs of some stability, recovery from the day's low as the Nifty went down to 21,700. You know, Thursday, you saw that acceleration, that pickup. And today, things are very, very quiet. In fact, it would have been a lot better if it wasn't for the fall in the IT stocks. So if you pull up the contribution plate, about 40 points from the Nifty are taken off courtesy the IT uh, stocks, particularly Infi, TCS, Wipro, L, you know, all of them are actually down. So if it wasn't for the, you know, 3% fall in the IT names, uh, the Nifty would have actually been up by close to about 65 points. But again, you know, compared to the fall that we're seeing across the rest of the Asian markets, our picture is not bad. Hang Seng is down 3%. Shanghai is down 1.5%. Kospi is also trading mildly lower. Uh, I think barring Nikkei, all the other Asian markets are lower. If you talk about a quiet close, the week has been anything but quiet. Yeah, yeah. And uh, But then it's a it's good It's been thing. a quiet close to a very volatile, <laughs> topsy-turvy, uh, full of action week. Full right? of action week, absolutely. And it's, 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 that kind of, it's been that kind of a week. And as you mentioned, right, IT has been the pain point. We've been highlighting this through the week that IT has been the underperformer in, even before today's drop. The IT index is off the lowest point of the day, but it's still down 2%. And if you pull up the indices now, the, on a weekly basis, the Nifty and the Nifty Bank both are flat. Now, Monday, Tuesday, we saw that correction as Reema just mentioned. The, there you can see that the Nifty is flat. The Nifty Bank is up around half a percent. So is the mid cap index. The small cap index is the one to highlight though. It's up a percent for the week. Now on a weekly basis that may not mean much but this will be the first weekly advance if it does happen for the small cap index since the end of January. Mm. So almost a two month gap before the small cap index has seen a positive weekly close if it does manage to end above that uh, uh, post a weekly gain. So good going there for the small cap index, the broader markets, they rebounded yesterday. They are continuing with that momentum today as well. But the sore spot IT, as we mentioned, we've been highlighting this as well. Uh, the worst week now, it's down 6%. For the week and it's the worst week since December of 2022 and why is that happening it's been happening all through the week but today there is a specific reason behind it and that is because Accenture after its earnings cut its fiscal year 2024 growth guidance and Reema will tell us the five reasons why this is happening well you know first let's start with what is this guidance cut right by Accenture so the first point is that they've lowered their full year revenue forecast Earlier, they were guiding for a 2 to 5% revenue growth. Now they're guiding for a 1 to 3% growth. The cut in the organic guidance is a lot more, you know, it appears to be a lot worse. Earlier, it was 0 to 3%. Now they're talking about the possibility of negative organic growth. And even the margin guidance has been trimmed. So that's point number one. These are the numbers for Accenture's, you know, the new forecast. Two, why did they cut the guidance? What changed in the last three months? It appears that discretionary projects, particularly in the smaller size projects, sorry, discretionary spending, particularly in the smaller size project, have come under further pressure. That's what's changed. So the company does say in their conference call that the long-term, larger, uh, transformational kind of projects are intact. But the companies are funding it by, you know, cutting back on spending in the smaller project. Now the third question is, how does this impact the Indian IT, you know, companies here? Why is it that we're seeing such a big loss? Now, the, you know, the expectation was that FI24 was a very, very weak year for the IT companies, right? That in FI25, things will rebound. Now that is being questioned. Now, if you look at the consensus expectation, a couple of months back, everyone was talking about a double-digit kind of revenue growth for the IT companies, 10%, maybe 11%, but close to a double-digit, near double-digit. Now, Accenture is saying that the outsourcing business, which is, again, directly competing with the TCSs and Infis of the world, will be growing in mid-single digits. So is there a risk that the revenue forecast for the Indian IT companies for FY25 gets cut back? That's the big risk. Now, what, is, what are brokerages saying now? CLSA says that IT remains in an earnings down cycle. It's not reflected in the valuations. Morgan Stanley also says that consensus revenue forecasts for FI25 are at risk. And the pace of recovery, which is assumed over the coming quarters, could be slower than expected. But here I'd just like to add one caveat, is that Accenture's numbers are August ending, right? 
Uh, so their guidance only takes into account, you know, from an Indian IT perspective from April to August, Correct. right? So if your forecasts were assuming that in the second half of the year, FY25, things were going to rebound, it's not getting captured in the Accenture's numbers. So that's an important point. Now, how have the Indian IT stocks performed? Well, today, of course, you're seeing a big cut. But, you know, going into this event also, um, you know, I think the street has been a bit nervous about the numbers. So, in, you know, month to date, the Nifty IT index is down 7.5%, while the Nifty has been on the flatter side, with names like Infi, HCL Tech, nearly down double digit. And just a quick word on generative AI, since that's the buzz, you are seeing a big pickup in generative AI bookings. On a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis for Accenture, it's up 33%. But I think now, you know, the street is going to price in a very cautious guidance from uh, IT numbers in, in, you know, in come April when Infi and HCL Tech. So I think some of that optimism is now going to fade away. And going into the numbers, you will see that cautiousness. We we'll know all of that in two weeks from now. And yeah. the nervousness is showing in the, in, on the numbers, right? The Nifty IT index has turned negative for the year now, courtesy the fall that we've seen this month. And speaking of IT, earlier we spoke to Manik Taneja, who is the executive director of IT services at Access Capital, to understand how this would impact the Indian IT companies. Listen to what he had to say. Just like the excitement started to get built up cross names, Similarly, some of this disappointment will also percolate to almost everyone in the sector. This will possibly be a hit, be a be a sort of a dampener for the likes of Infosys, Wipro, and while I would say that it will essentially have negative ramifications for almost everyone in the sector. Uh, from a number standpoint or from an outlook standpoint, I would presume that the guidance that the likes of an Infosys and HCL Tech will issue amongst the larger companies may disappoint street expectations. So we're looking at the street expectations being in excess of 8% plus for Infosys in FY25. Given a uh, significant possibility of improvement from a margin standpoint, from an operation standpoint, so that alone can be a significant driver of earnings growth for the, for the name over a three, four year period. And that's the reason for preferring that name. Uh, amongst the mid, mid cap names, uh, Zensar is a buy for us. We have sell slash reduce across most of the other tier 2 coverage universe. That is all the commentary around Indian IT. But the one sector that is doing very well for itself is real estate. After a prolonged lull that we've seen uh, around the last 8 to 10 days, the real estate index is staging a bounce back. And one stock among that is Prestige Estates. And that is surging in today's session after the company acquired around 62 and a half acres of land in Indirapuram extension in the NCR. Sonal is here with more details. Sonal, how much development potential does this entail? Oh, well, it's huge actually. But first, let me tell you the news. Uh, the company through its will be acquiring 62 and a half acres of land which is in the Indirapuram extension in NCR and the cost of acquisition is around 468 crore rupees uh, this will be uh, along with the revenue share as well now the projected gross development value is above 10,000 crore rupees now it's huge because remember as of nine months of FI24 the total sales of the company together is around 16,333 crore rupees they have a projection of 20,000 crores of sales for FI24 so this is half of what the company plans to do in FY24 itself. In fact, the company earlier had indicated that their FY26 sales target is 25,000 crore rupees. Looks like they could achieve it before that itself. And NCR by FY26 will be around 3,000 crore rupees in terms of sales. So this is a way bigger number than that. Um, so looks like a lot of NCR interest is coming by. So it's not only from Prestige. Actually, Godrish Properties recently in this month itself bought a land of around 6.46 acres in Noida uh, to develop a 500 crore rupee housing project. So so uh, the NCR region continues to see a lot of focus. Signature Global last year also indicated they bought 25.75 acre land in Gurugram itself. Uh, so NCR has been seeing price rise and now it's seeing interest coming in from developers when it comes to land acquisitions as well. Okay, thank you very much for that. We'll get into a break on that note. On the other side, we'll discuss commodities. Manisha Gupta joins in on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching Trading R here on CNBC TV 18. The market has surged to the 
closing is building on the gains as we speak the nifty is back above the 22050 mark now but let's shift focus now to the commodity space manisha gupta is joining in and today we are focusing on crude manisha good morning is the boil in oil cooling down slightly now uh, it is yes and that should be supportive for the equity markets here in the regions as well well yes after almost doing 88 dollars a barrel we are holding around 85 at this point in time so nearly 2 and a half dollars off the kind of highs that the crude oil price has touched in this week itself so markets are looking looking at a conversation about gaza cease fire possibility as early as in the next week and that clearly has been a supportive uh, had that clearly has let some pressure off the prices and we are looking at some decline also the us dollar strength uh, has led to some profit taking across asset classes including commodities as well the markets also are looking at the fact that uh, the demand numbers that have come in from europe have been slightly on the weaker side but as far as asia and us go the physical demand for crude and products is still on the higher side is the reason 85 dollars per barrel is still holding on your screens the other thing is that the with the kind of ukraine attacks that we've seen on russia facilities nearly 10% of capacity is now offline and that would continue to keep the prices on where they are the street is also taking in the cognizance that the us inventories have seen a decline of nearly 1.9 million barrels this is the biggest decline in us inventories in last two months so while we are off the highs but the markets do believe that at these current levels you could be looking at a fair sustainability in the markets going forward there are various reports from wall street brokers and banks suggesting that second and the third quarter could see demand improving even more from asia especially china and 90 and 95 of a range is where most of them are working with Thank you very much for that. After going to 87, Brent has cooled down to about $85 per barrel. Perhaps that's what's explaining the outperformance partly of the Indian markets. Uh, I'll get into a break. We'll discuss market technicals. Jay Tucker of ICIC Securities joins us with his top trading bets. Welcome back. Let's turn our attention now to footwear companies like Bata and Metro Brands. There is a Goldman Sachs report out today where they're initiating coverage on these two stocks. Manglam joins in with the details on what their view is. Manglam Everyone's suddenly excited about footwear. You know, at the start of the year, Motilal Oswal put out a note saying that Metro Brands is perhaps their stock of the year for 2024. And just a couple of days ago, we had Dam Capital initiating coverage on the footwear space. They too said that Metro Brands is best place right now. And today we have a follow-up coming in from Goldman Sachs. They again say that you know the branded footwear penetration in India is rising. Unbranded market share. is down from 85% to 75%. Remember 5 years ago people would speak that about uh, possibility as soon as the GST was implemented and they've said that you know in the branded space itself 40 to 60% of the market share is consolidated with the top 15 brands itself. So in that it's the multi brand retailers who are best positioned to capture this rising penetration and in that the one category which is doing extremely well is sports and athleisure. uh you know goldman sachs believes that sports and athleisure as a category can compound at 13% for the next two decades over the next 20 years itself and for metro which has fila and an agreement with foot locker sports and athleisure could be about 17% of the revenues in the next 10 years and also bata uh, you know they've been reworking their portfolio their portfolio premiumization is still yet to revive growth but this is a stock that they are keeping on their radar too so they've initiated coverage on metro brands with a target price of 1450 and a buy rating with bata the target price is not too far away from metro 1470 but they have a neutral rating there Interesting. Thanks a lot, Mangalam, for joining in. Metro Brands is off the highest point of the day, though it was up around five and a half percent at the start of the trading session. It's now almost up two and a half percent. It's almost two percent, so giving up most of the gains that it made at the start of the trading session. But moving on now, and all three oil marketing companies, HPCL, BPCL, Indian Oil, are surging in today's trading session. Sonal is joining in with the bull versus bear analysis on these stocks coming in from CLSA and Nomura. Sonal, about time, right? Yeah. It's this much talked about topic on the street. But you know the street is always split, so not able to make up its mind. But let me talk about CLSA first up. They have been uh, reiterating, reiterating themselves for a while, and again they have done so. They say that crude prices at eighty-eight dollars per barrel. This would mean that marketing margins uh, would just be at the level of a break-even uh, path. 
if it goes above that, it could start reporting losses as well. And this is something which would lead losses in the marketing segment for all the three oil marketing companies, be it uh, IOCL, be it HPCL and be it BPCL. And remember, HPCL has the highest exposure to the marketing, marketing segment here. They say given upcoming national elections, a retail price hike is unlikely, which will mean that there's lack of pricing power and more losses. They reiterate their sell on the stocks. Numura, on the other hand, they have a very different view. They have upgraded HPCL. They have raised the target price here. The same is the case for BPCL and IOC as well. Um, and here they say that with the price cut that happened last week, the overhang is done away with when it comes to marketing segment. In fact, they are positive on the refining side, where they say they are building in refining margins of $9 per barrel for FY25 and FY26. And this is above the Singapore GRMs, which are trading at lower levels right now. They are saying favorable crude sourcing will come continue to favor their refining margins and they are actually bullish on the refining side and also they think that marketing overhang is over so the only risk from here on is crude oil prices uh, but those have stabilized around 86 dollars barrel uh, per barrel for today but we will have to see which way things go okay thank you very much for that jay tucker of icsa securities is now with us for a quick technical check on the market um, Jay, holding up 22,072, 58 point gain on the Nifty despite the pressure coming in from IT. Uh, what have you made of the action, the price action over the last two or three trading sessions? Are you seeing a lot of upside? Hi, uh, you know, uh, very good morning to you, Rima. Uh, Rima, I would say that uh, yes, we have seen uh, you know, a lot of uh, sideways to you know volatile momentum uh, in the past couple of trading sessions, but then I think that. Uh, uh, today's pressure was more of because of IT and we have seen markets recovering also quite well from the lower levels. I believe that 21,850 uh, to 21,800 is a very, very crucial support in the near term. And Nifty is holding uh, those levels. Till then, you know, the probability of upside until 22,300, uh, 22,400 is quite likely. On an immediate basis, I think that 22,400 is what is on card. So from these levels, I think the risk load is very much favorable on the long side. Uh, one can buy uh, placing a stop loss below 21,900, targeting 21, uh, 22,200 to 300 on an immediate basis and eventually 22,400 in this bounce back. But then uh, the short term trend, uh, at least until next uh, you know, weekly expiry, which is monthly expiry as well, Rima, that uh, uh, seems to be bullish uh, uh, until the next weekly expiry. Uh, you know, keeping that in mind, I have two buy recommendations. I would say the first buy recommendation is on uh, GNFC. This stock seems to be quite oversold. Uh, no, it's, it's fallen in a five-year declining structure. I think that uh, GNFC uh, is likely to bounce back from the current levels, retracing its entire fall, uh, Rima. And we have seen a good positive divergence coming in as well. So it's trading around the levels of 630. I'm expecting this stock to bounce back until levels of 660, 685 in the near term. Uh, one can place a stop loss at 615 and uh, go long on this. Uh, the second buy recommendation would be on Maruti. Now this stock has been trending up. I mean, despite the market volatility, or a downtrend is we are seeing a, seeing a clear strength out here and uh, you know it's trading above the levels of 12,000 which was quite an important level to watch out for about 12,000 I think with a stop loss of 11,800 one can go along with Maruti targeting 12,400 to 12,600 in the, in the near term so GNFC and Maruti these are the two uh, buy recommendation uh, buy recommendation for the short term all right, thanks a lot, Jay, for joining in and sharing with us your views on the index and specific stocks as well. GNFC and Maruti, there are two stock recommendations coming in from Jay Tucker. But time for a short break here on Trading R. Up next, we get you some corporate conversations. Rajiv C. Modi from Saskin Technologies joins us on the other side to discuss their business outlook and the recent acquisitions. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back. Now, Saskin is in focus after the company announced yesterday its plans to acquire a 60% stake in Anoop Silicon as it complements the company's business and assists in its expansion. Uh, to talk about the you know, way forward you know, for the company, we are now joined by Rajiv C. Modi, Chairman and Managing Director at Saskin Technology. Uh, Mr. Modi, uh, morning. This is Reema here. You know, before we get chatting about this acquisition, Wanted your quick comment from you know what Accenture had to say the guidance cut for FI24. In what way has the demand environment changed in the last three months, and how do you expect FI25 to be for the industry and for your company? Yeah, morning, uh, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for having uh, 
having us today. Uh, we definitely, I mean, in, we are in product engineering uh, services business, and in that space, we definitely are seeing good, good demand, good growth. Uh, and today, frankly speaking, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, the work shifting to India and, and new product getting introduced, particularly in the automotive market, in the semiconductors market, devices, and satellite communication. So I think those four are, are growth trajectories that we are, we are uh, really, really uh, uh, happy about. And we definitely expect to show growth in the in the coming uh, coming quarters. So I think uh, I can only comment on on the space that we operate in, uh, and and that's that's what we are expecting and experiencing in the market today. Right, Mr. Modi. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining in. Let's get to the acquisition that you have recently made. You've acquired a sixty percent stake in Anup Silicon for around thirty eight crore rupees. What, can you tell us more about the company that you have just acquired and how does this complement your business and what would be the analyzed run rate, rev, rev, revenue run rate that you would be looking at through this acquisition? Yeah, so I think Anoop Silicon, of course, is going to get renamed as uh, Saskin Silicon. is a company founded by Anoop uh, Saula. He is an entrepreneur who has built a business creating many analog IPs as well as which have been validated by global foundries. We are seeing a great opportunity for us to really enter into the silicon design space because it's an inflection point that we are we are looking at where uh, system companies are also now starting to focus on designing their own silicon because the life of silicon and the software is is what's going to play out critically in the in the years to come. So towards that, I, we thought of investing into this because he brought in business as well as capability. And we bring in a, a rich set of customers that we can go after immediately. And this is the combination that we believe is going to really drive the, the growth for Sask and Silicon. The objective of Sask and Silicon is to focus on silicon design, IP-led design, foundry services. So it's going to be a pure play, silicon design, uh, business uh, that we will focus on. Obviously, I'm sure you've heard also in India, semiconductors is picking pace because everybody has rely, realized that semiconductors is, is the new oil and you better have, have a control over that. So we are equally bullish about that vector, that trajectory also. So keeping all these things in mind, I think we, we thought of it as, a, as an opportunity for us to invest and and grow this business, and that is what we expect to do in the coming years. Uh, so, just <clears throat> this Saskin Silicon uh, is this is this something new? I mean, I missed that part. Or does it have revenues right now? And this Anoop Silicon gets integrated into it? Yeah. So, uh, Anoop Silicon is is a, a business that has been created by Anoop Saula. His business is in there, and we are putting in the monies, and we'll rename it as Saskin Silicon. Okay. is the is okay. the point I'm making. So there is existing right. running business, there is existing IPs that are there which are very valuable sure. analog IPs. Okay, uh, so what are the revenues of, uh, you know, Anoop Silicon, which will later be renamed as Saskin Silicon? Um, today, at least the quarterly, you know, annualized run rate? No, today it's, it's extremely small, but we are okay. working together to build it out. So we expect it to make... Uh, uh, be, be generating revenues in the new financial year and show significant growth uh, from there on. And do you have plans to further acquire the balance 40% stake? Uh, uh, there is no, no uh, discussion at the present moment. The focus, honestly, is on us to grow the business together. He's an entrepreneur. He's a very seasoned uh, uh, engineer himself. And we work together to ensure that clear focus is on creating value and creating strong business in this entire thing. And to build your expertise in this particular area, you know, silicon design, the foundry, etc., would you be looking to make some additional investments, not in Anoop Silicon, which you've already explained, but is there another acquisition that you could look at, another investment, a partnership, just to complement this entire, you know, proposition of yours? So everything that we will do in silicon design, we'll all do in Anoop Silicon or whatever we'll call a Saskin Correct. Silicon. So everything will build out because we want it to be a focused pure play in silicon design, 
boundary services, IP-led design. So that is the clear focus that we are going to drive and anything we do in acquisition or anything will be in that, which will be focused again on silicon design. We'll focus on, you know, growing the Saskin Silicon, but is are there more investments planned? Are you looking but, at more acquisitions to grow this business? There is all, we keep on the lookout. We don't have anything specific now, but if there is something, we'll obviously come back. And how much do you think your silicon business can contribute three years or five years down the line? I we know the opportunity I, is immense, but for you, yeah, exactly. what could it mean in terms of numbers? I mean, the, the aggress aggressive growth plans that we are building out is at least uh, 30 plus, 40 plus million dollars in the next two to three years. Right. Uh, one final question, Mr. Modi. How are margins looking this quarter? Have they seen an improvement compared to the third quarter? Very quickly, if you can tell us I that. Can't, I can't answer. We are in quiet period. And I, my apologies, I can't answer that question. All right, Mr. Modi, thank you so much for joining in and sharing with us your views on the acquisition that you've made and the massive opportunity that you see in the silicon design space. That was the management of Saskin Technologies there. The stock recovering from the lowest point of the day as we speak, but trading completely flat as of now. But time for a short break here on Trading R. Up next, we get you some market conversations going. Anirudh Garg from Invasit PMS will join us on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Trading R. The market is now at the day's high. The Nifty is nearing 20 to 100 as we speak. And one stock that is doing really well for itself is Bajaj Auto. And that stock is nearing the mark of 9,000 rupees a share. It made a high of 9,009 in today's trading session. It's now nearing very close to its buyback price of 10,000 rupees. Good time to get in Anirudh Garg, who is the partner and fund manager at Invasit PMS, who is joining us to discuss some more about the markets. Anirudh, good morning. Thank you so much for joining in. Before I ask you some other sectors, I want you to want to you want your views on the sector of the day, and that is IT. Are you in that camp who still believes that the prices of these stocks are still not baking in the fact that FY25 may also turn out to be another weak year as FY24 has been? I think, uh, first of all, a very good morning. Uh, I think the IT, the shallow uh, cyclicity that we see in IT is over. And, uh, you know, uh, it's just the last uh, area of pain that we are seeing for us. We believe that IT should not be a problem going ahead. It's a good place. The valuations are there. And uh, the growth concerns that we see currently, the markets, we believe they always price in the future, the next two, two and a half years should not be very uh, problematic for IT because the cyclicity that they experience every five to 10 years, um, I think that period is in the past now. Right, since you spoke of valuations, one pocket in the market where the street does not believe is has valuation comfort is PSUs. And they've had a stellar run all through 2023. They're seeing a bit of a correction at the start of the year as we uh, as of now. But do you, within this entire PSU basket, find a segment where there is still value? See, we have been holding PSUs, mid caps and small caps for the last one and a half years. We just exited all our positions and shifted to the quality phase because we believe that the markets overall are not, uh, you know, in a value zone now. These are expensive markets. A lot of money has been made in the last one, one and a half year. And as important as the preservation, uh, appreciation of capital, equally important is the preservation of capital and alpha that you have generated. PSUs have led the run. They'll keep leading the run going forward. There will be volatility in between. And, uh, you know, there'll be sharp up moves, sharper down moves. And uh, till the valuation comfort comes, yes. In the last one, one and a half year, last 18, 20 months, it's the first time that we feel that the valuation comfort is not there. And uh, the last one month fairly has, you know, uh, it's made them a bit okay. But still, still the valuation comfort for us is not there. We believe that another 15 to 20% downside from here in the mid and small caps, especially the PSUs and CAPEX and CAPEX related industries will put us in a zone of comfort back in. You spoke of quality, Anirudh. Uh, have you, are you still holding on to any quality PSUs according to you? I wouldn't ask you names, but are there any sectors which you are still holding on to since you mentioned you've exited all your positions there? 
Uh, I am not shy of speaking of names. Uh, yes, we are holding to quality PSUs like State Bank of India and uh, the larger ones, I would say. Okay. Uh, you, you spoke about IT, you spoke about a couple of these PSUs. Uh, in PSUs, uh, defense and railways, they have seen the maximum run up. So when you are talking about, when you expect a further moderation in stock prices, what's the outlook on defense and railways? Because here people have the order visibility, the long term picture looks good. The question is only about whether you should enter at these levels. Where do you stand on defense and railways? The defense and railways are the sectors of this run. Every run, yeah. you know, maybe the 2001, 2008 had capital goods and uh, real estate followed by Reliance. Then we had IT, Pharma, FMCG in the new economy. Again, in this old economy, it is CAPEX and CAPEX oriented cycle industries. Defense and railways are the biggest uh, beneficiaries of the current government policies and have maximum relative change with them. We believe going ahead, they will lead the pack. The valuations in defense are giving me a little bit of comfort now than they were three or four months ago. Railways, we are still not very comfortable. Also, the behavioral science principles that set in a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of funds focused on PSUs, railways, defense have come up. So, you know, when the market gets overcrowded, you need a little bit of correction. So are we bullish on defense for the next two years? Yes, we are very mm -hmm. bullish on defense and railways. But yes, we are expecting deep correction in these pockets from time to time. And currently, the structure looks weak to us for the next two to three year horizon or two to three months horizon. Sorry. Right. Uh, shifting focus from PSUs on your to autos. And that is one sector that has been outperforming as of late. Uh, Bajaj, Tata Motors, TVS, Hero, all of them, you name them and they are gaining almost 90 to 100% over the last 12 months. Where is it that you find your comfort with it, the four wheelers or the two wheelers? Or if I may add, if I may add, the tractors as well. So no comfort in tractors at all for us. Uh, the maximum comfort today is in uh, four wheelers and uh, especially Tata Motors and Mahindra and Mahindra. Both are fantastic companies, fantastic products. See, the world is going through a premiumization drive. Um, the asset prices that have gone up post uh, COVID has put in a lot of disposable income in the hands of uh, the Indian consumer and consumers worldwide. So this premiumization shift that is helping every sector which is consumer oriented and is catering to a little bit of luxury. May, may it be cars, may it be hotels, airlines. So all these, all these, uh, you know, sectors should be the focus for the next six months to one year at least. So anything which is based on premiumization. Hmm. What about uh, real estate? Um, you know, we've seen this acute water shortage in Bangalore, dire states right now. Is it impacting things on the ground for Bangalore real estate players? I think that's a journey. Uh, that's a journey that everyone has to go through. Uh, reforms come in, kick in from time to time. They are necessary. But uh, real estate for us is one of the top picks, especially the luxury real estate followed by industrial real estate and then the normal housing, uh, affordable housing. Uh, I don't think it will be a problem going ahead. I think it will fuel more uh, purchases going ahead. Should not be a problem for Bangalore people. And it was good talking to you. Thank you so much for joining in and sharing your views on multiple sectors, especially the PSUs. We are expecting another 15 to 20 percent correction in some mid cap and small cap PSUs. Thanks a lot for joining in and sparing your time. Time for a short break here on Trading Hour. When we return, we throw the spotlight on the insurance space and we'll be joined by Noama's Madhukar Lada. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's turn our attention now to the insurance sector. Nuvama is positive on the insurance sector as it sees strong growth in the health segment post-COVID. To talk about the trends in health, life, motor insurance, we're now joined by Madhukar Ladda, Director at Nuvama Institutional Equities. Uh, Madhukar, morning and thank you for joining in. Let's start with life insurance companies first. There was this IRDAI board meeting recently where they did consider the surrender value and what should it be. Uh, we understand from sources that the final, while the dust hasn't settled on the issue right now, we've not got the final word, but it does appear that it could be a watered down version compared to what was previously reported, which would have hurt life insurance companies. Where do you stand on life insurance companies per se and what are the big trends? 
Sure, sure. Uh, morning. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so, uh, you know, this uh, this draft on surrender values has been a big overhang, and uh, the 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 previous draft, which was released in December, was uh, quite harsh. I would say uh, the expectation largely has been that the watered down version uh, will not dramatically change uh, surrender values in the first five years. So that I think. Uh, will be quite beneficial because uh, my a large part of the profits also of uh, some of the uh, non-link savings product uh, come from uh, surrender value, right? Because uh, the companies also spend a lot on acquiring customers. Uh, so uh, my sense is that definitely that the relief should be pretty uh, pretty big, and it's it's very important that the relief be there. Uh, we're still awaiting for the final uh, regulation to come through. Uh, so, so, yeah, we, we have to wait for it. Uh, I think uh, stocks did rally a little bit uh, in anticipation of this watered-down draft. And we're seeing a little bit maybe of uh, of some, uh, you know, profit booking happening uh, right now post all this uh, news flow on, on, on this topic. Uh, on the broader trends, I think, I think the sector has done very well, uh, especially in the last quarter. And and I think, uh, you know, uh, kudos to the insurance companies because I think uh, they they knew that uh, March is a very high base, and and that's why they've probably been uh, aggressively selling in Jan and February. Both the months for the private sector life insurance companies has seen. Uh, you know, a growth of 20% at the industry level and company uh, company wide numbers have been even better, especially the listed companies have also done very well uh, in this period. Uh, uh, partly, and, and and my sense is that ULIPs have also uh, played a big role because markets have done well and uh, uh, simultaneously par, non-par has also, uh, I think through particular uh, few channels, the push of there has also been good. Uh, protection is also seeing a good comeback, which is which is quite healthy for the companies. These are higher margin products. So uh, all in all, uh, I think top line uh, is has has been pretty pretty good. Uh, and and you know even until Feb, growth for the private sector is at about thirteen percent at an EP level. So uh, even if we were to say that March will not be that good, uh, and in March last year. We'd seen a growth of about fifty-three percent year over year. So uh, still, these the the sector as such should see growth for the full year. Uh, my expectation would be at least five percent. Uh, yeah. So uh, broadly, still very very uh, uh, optimistic, and I think uh, positively surprised right. definitely for Jan and Feb. Right. Uh, Madhukar, I wanted to shift focus actually to the motor insurance space and in your note also, you've highlighted that the new age players, be it GoDigit or be it Echo, they are outperforming the legacy players uh, as we speak. But are you seeing this trend continuing going forward and do you see a threat to the market share of the incumbents at the hands of, hand of, hands of these new age players? Uh yeah, that definitely seems to be the case. So, uh, so for example, uh, GoDigit uh, in about the last three four years has taken up six percent market share in the motor space. Uh, Aco has also been growing consistently over a period of time, um, and uh, we are seeing uh, uh, the larger private sector uh, insurance companies lose market share. So both. Lombard and Bajik have lost a little bit of market share. Uh, Lombard in the recent months, seemed, there seems to be some improvement. Uh, and uh, also commentary from the management has been that there has been some letdown in comparative intensity. That is also helping them, uh, you know, regain a little bit of their market share. So... Uh, things are quite uh, quite comparative. You, you, you can see... A couple of months of letdown, and then still, and then then you know competitive intensity picking up uh, again. But motor is is very difficult to call, and I think uh, I think. Uh, uh, are I, the I, 
Sorry, sure. sorry to interrupt. How much lower is the pricing by GoDigit and Echo compared to the traditional players on a like-to-like -like basis? It's 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 very very uh, difficult to call that out. Uh, okay. And, and because uh, you know, and and the and, and the pricing is different at the OD uh, in the OD segment. TP the prices are the same, and in OD it, it completely depends on which channel you are acquiring. Uh, players have also started giving. Uh, discounts uh, based on the agent uh, through which they're acquiring business. So, so that's a very, um, very difficult question. And you know, uh, your pricing differs from models, variants, uh, geography. So, it, it's it's not that uh, straightforward out there. Yeah. So then, just to put it in context for our viewers, what's the extent of the market share loss for ICICI Lombard and for the Bajaj Group in motor insurance? Do we have those numbers? See over so, the last 12 months? So last 12 months, actually, Lombard has done well. So the market share okay. loss has only been about 20 basis points. But over a period of time, the loss would have been a little bit higher than that. Uh, similarly, for uh, even for Bajaj. So Bajaj, uh, if I remember correctly, the loss is closer to about 60, 70 basis points. But on okay. a slightly longer term, on a two, on a two three year horizon, the, the market share loss would be slightly higher. All right, Madhukar, we leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining in and sharing your views on the overall insurance space, motor, health, and even life insurance. Thank you so much for joining in and sparing your time. That was Madhukar Lada from Nuvama. Well, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Trading R. The market continues to do well for itself, but from Reema, myself, and the entire team that put this show together, thank you so much for watching. Halftime Report takes the action forward.